what have we seen so far so let's quickly go through what we did yesterday okay we took a feedback system with an integrator and some delay right and we wrote down the differential equation for that system right what did that give us it gave us something like this 1 by omega u dv not by dt equals vi of t minus vo of t minus td over k okay what we did was we took a very simple case when vi of t was zero right in a more general case you will have to solve this differential equation and get the uh, you know get the solution for this okay now when we solved it we found we first looked at it and decided that you know sinusoid seem to solve the uh, differential to be one of the solution and exponential is also one of the solutions because delay just means scaling correct so then we first found out the solutions of the form e power sigma t so and then we replace sigma by a normalized sigma prime which was sigma over omega u over k and tau which is omega u over k times td okay so we reduce it to this form sigma prime plus e power minus sigma prime tau is zero then we try to solve it graphically by plotting it so first one of them is f1 of sigma prime the other two is the exponential f2 of sigma prime and then we plotted the sum of the two and for some cases you will find that there are two solutions right so we looked at those two solutions yesterday so and then the generalized term for expression for v v not of t is just going to be a linear combination of two these two exponentials and we also found so what we actually uh, this one is uh, for a different thing and we also i guess we we i told you we didn't conclude it but i told you to check that in a more general case sigma 1 and sigma 2 will be larger than minus 1 correct uh, as in magnitude wise larger more negative than minus 1 so they will settle down faster correct so we are going to do that so that will probably be part of homework number 2 so you are going to do a bunch of things one of them is you are going to solve a particular case of this differential equation maybe with a step response uh, with a step input and then you are going to find out what your sigma 1 sigma 2 are then you are also going to find out another thing we notice so of course sigma r equal to minus 1 is the original case with no delay then you get some cases then there will be one critical case where these two sigma 1 prime and sigma 2 prime will merge into one point so you'll will you'll do a problem on that also on the homework so for that case you can find out the condition on what td has to be or what tau has to be okay for that condition okay beyond that what happens beyond that it turns out that the sum of these two expressions is always positive f1 of sigma prime and f2 of sigma prime is always positive so what that means is you won't have real roots right real solution now you need to go look at complex solutions but first of all actually if you look at this what is the order of this system if you have a system like this what is the order i mean how many roots is it going to have it's actually going to have infinite roots in this case we found out the two most dominant roots right why do we care only about the dominant roots <laughs> suppose you didn't have just sigma 1 and sigma 2 you had sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 and so on till sigma n which which ones are important and why exactly so obviously for the more dominant ones if if sigma 1 and sigma 2 are closer or in magnitude they are smaller their transient response will be much slower if you have very large like very very negative sigma sigmas sigma primes what happens is that transient responses will settle down much faster correct so in the time you of in the, this thing you don't you don't uh, necessarily need to worry about them too much okay and of course it's quite possible that the other roots are also complex okay
Okay. So, <laughs> and I think we also discussed that the case where it just barely touches this is going to be similar to your critical damping case in your in your second order system. So that is what you are going to be doing in your homework. So we will let it go for now. After the homework is done, we will discuss it. Okay. So now let's, okay, let's say that critical, I am going to call that TD naught. Okay. That is the case when the curve just has two coincidental roots, it so happens. Okay. So we'll today we'll look at quickly look at the case where what happens when TD is greater than TD naught. So now we no longer have real roots. So instead of so we are going to substitute S equals sigma plus J omega. Okay. And again I can now normalize this as sigma plus J omega over omega u over k. So I am going to call this sigma prime plus j omega prime. Okay. So first of all, I don't know if you noticed but this omega u over k number keeps popping up all the time, everywhere. Right? Why do you think that is? Okay, no, that is one thing. Okay, in this case we are normalizing it. But I am talking about in the case we looked at a single pole system, right? We found that the bandwidth, uh, time constant, everything was related to omega u over k or k or omega u or something like that, right? The pole. Exactly. So we will see later today that it is actually related to the loop gain, okay? So we will see that after we get done with this uh, sinusoidal uh, solution. <laughs> so now you are trying to solve S, di S, uh, S prime plus e power minus s prime tau is 0. So this is the one, this is the equation you are trying to solve. So s prime is sigma prime plus j omega prime plus okay and now this portion You can split it as e power minus sigma prime tau, which is the real number, times what is e power minus j omega prime tau? So it's what is it cos of minus omega prime tau, right? Because you have e power minus j omega prime tau, which happens to be cos of omega prime tau, and then what is the other term? Minus j sine. Correct? So now how do you solve this? Obviously you can set the real part to 0, imaginary part to 0. Right? So real part to 0 will give you omega uh, sigma prime is and then the imaginary part setting the imaginary part to 0 will give you Mega prime. Okay, so these are the two equations, and obviously they are not very explicit, right? They obviously have exponentials. They have each equation is dependent on the other variable and so on. It's not very easy to separate it. So you can solve this in, of course, it may be easier to use numerical methods. But what we'll do is we'll try to look at it in a slightly simpler way. We'll try to simplify these so that we we can at least plot some of the functions. So one of the things we can do is because we have sine and cosine. One thing you can think of is square and add these two because you know sine square plus cos square is 1. Okay, so let's try doing that. I mean actually the only reason we are doing the squaring and adding is to simplify things further to get a little bit more insight into how the, uh, how you solve this, that's all. Okay, so you get sigma squared plus omega prime squared is Okay, 
e power minus 2 sigma sigma prime tau. So if you want to plot this in the sigma prime omega prime space, what do you think is going to look like? Anybody? What does the left hand side portion look like? Looks like the equation of a circle. Okay? Right hand side is obviously an exponential. What happens when tau is very small? It looks like when tau is very small, e power minus sigma tau, let's say tau is 0, it's going to be 1. Right? So it's going to, for very small tau, it's going to look like a circle. Right? Okay? As tau slowly increases, uh, okay, let's assume that's a circle. Okay? As tau increases, the circle is going to get even more distorted than I have drawn it. Okay? So you're going to get something like this. Some, something slightly distorted. And if you keep increasing further, Um, you know what, I'm going to move to the next page because uh, I don't have space to draw this. Okay. So if you increase tau further, so what will happen is, you will find that, you remember this uh, critical damping factor, let's say we call that uh, TD naught and tau naught, okay? As tau increases further, you will find the curve behaving like this. Something like that. You can try plotting this for yourself. It's, it's, you know, you can just use MATLAB or something and plot it. Okay, you'll get something like this. Okay, so what happens, sub, let's say you want to get one more relation. So now you have got one equation, you have plotted it graphically. Next equation, easier thing may be to, let us say we divide these two equations, one by the other. So that gives you sigma prime over omega prime is minus cotangent omega prime tau. So we we'll rewrite this as minus omega prime over sine omega prime tau. So you can simplify it further. For example, you can even put the sine and the omega prime together and write it as a sinc function. Okay, whichever is easy for you to plot. And eventually you will have to solve it. Okay, so I am not going to solve the equation here. But basically the idea is you will you'll need to use numerical solutions or some, some other kind of more powerful tool to help you solve this case. For example, in the homework, I will let you use uh, some kind of MATLAB or anything you want. Okay, so the important thing is If you have small tau, so what you'll find is the sigmas are in the left half plane, so you get dying exponentials. Okay. If you have, let us say, sigma equals sig. Um, so for, let's say, sorry, tau, tau equals some tau a, okay, what you'll find is, you'll get some case where sigma prime is 0, so s prime will just be j omega prime, so in which case, the poles will lie on the j omega axis, that will be the unstable case, correct, that will be the case when the system is oscillating.
okay so this is a sinusoid of constant amplitude okay if now tau increases even further if you have even more delay okay remember tau is proportional to td so if tau increases even further what happens So the poles now move into the right half plane and you'll start getting a growing exponential sorry an exponentially growing sinusoid okay obviously the latter last two cases are unstable right okay <laughs> now let's find out i mean obviously i mean for a for a general case it's not very easy to find an analytical solution right and we find that graphical solutions are more useful so what we'll do is we'll go back to our um network model of your feedback and learn how we can uh, solve the um, stability and other things graphically okay so before that so this is your generic model of your feedback system okay we know v o over v i is a over 1 plus a f this we can write as 1 over f times a f over 1 plus a f right so this is basically 1 over f times t over 1 plus t and we know that t is the loop gain of the system and you know that if your loop gain is very large okay and if your loop gain is very small what is v over vi is just a right so what this means is your loop gain so what is this what is the v over vi equals a mean it actually means you have no feedback correct if you have an just an open loop system if you gave vi here you'll get v over there right and v over vi would be a so what this means is your loop gain your parameter t is quantifying the strength of feedback okay okay <laughs> so suppose for our earlier case single pole integrator with the resistive feedback right suppose we try to plot the loop gain what does it look like suppose uh, what is the open loop gain look like first of all okay suppose you try to plot uh, okay so let us say you plot t itself okay suppose you plot t itself for this case okay if you plot magnitude of t that's going to look like this because it's just omega u over s times 1 over k correct yes so what is this point this will just be omega u over k if you plot the loop gain i'm going to call this omega the unity gain of the unity gain frequency of the loop similarly if you plot angle of t in this particular case it's just going to be at minus pi by 2 okay <coughs> so now what this means is 
if you look at frequencies much lower than omega u over k, you have very strong feedback because t is very large. Okay? And here you have weak feedback. Okay? And eventually no feedback at all, almost no feedback at all. So in other words, it's not just enough if you just have, you know, some connection between the output and the input. You need to have something being fed back, in other words. Right? Okay? Now suppose for a, this is for a first order system. Now for a generic system, if you want to, if you want to, let's say, look at stability. Okay? How would you do it? So, has, uh, I remember some of you, half of, half the class said they have done control systems. The other half is doing it right now. Have you studied the uh, Nyquist criteria, criterion for uh, stability? The uh, people who are doing it this semester have not. Okay. So, maybe we'll quickly do that. Because, so, okay. So, what we're going to do is, the idea is, you're going to the, the Nyquist, uh, you plot something called a Nyquist plot. So, that is basically a, a polar plot of the loop gain. Okay, it's a polar plot of T. So, you take the, uh, you basically plot, imaginary, uh, on the y axis you have imaginary part of T, on the x axis you have real part of T, and you plot. Okay, and from that, you can actually tell something about stability. Okay, so that's what the Nyquist criterion is. Okay. So let's say, let's let's take a simple example. Okay. So we'll take an example of you say A of S is we'll take a three pole system. Um, I'll just call it P1, easier to write. Okay? And for this particular case, I'll also assume that F is frequency indep uh, independent. But it really doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, you're going to plot A times F, right, which is a loop gain. So it really doesn't matter. In this case, I'll assume F is, it's real and constant. And you know how to plot the body plot of this. So we'll start off with the body plot because we already know a lot about the body plot. So first you hit, let's say P1, then you hit P2, then you hit P3. Okay? The low frequency gain is 20 log A naught and you have minus 20, minus 40 and minus 60 dB per decade. So you are basically plotting this in dB. Okay. So let's say now you plot angle of J omega. Okay. So it's going to do something like this. So it ends up at minus 270 degrees. Okay? So it ends up at minus 270 degrees. Now if F is constant, then what we can do is, T of J omega is nothing but F times A of J omega. Okay? And now we can plot this on a polar plot. <coughs> so, on the polar plot, you're going to let omega go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, in other words, the axes are real part of t, uh, t and imaginary part of t. 
the variable on the curve is omega okay it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity so let us say we take it in this case this is the imaginary part so what is going to happen at omega equals 0 what is t at omega equals 0 a naught f which is t naught ok what is the angle 0 so I am going to call this t naught ok so let us say we start from 0 to infinity and then we will go from 0 to minus infinity also we will do both separately ok so what happens when omega increases you can look at the Bode plot and tell me tell me what is happening to the magnitude what is happening to the phase what the plot will look like what is going to happen when omega increases magnitude reduces ok what happens to the phase reduces and is negative correct so which quadrant are you going to be in fourth quadrant ok so you are going to go something like this you will get some plot ok ok so this is this starts from 0 to minus 270 so it keeps going eventually it will move into the third quadrant also ok if you keep going it will move into the third quadrant at some value of omega your angle is going to reach 180 degrees ok what will happen why will that happen on the polar plot at 180 degrees where will the point be where will T be smaller radius ok where else what else at omega equals my I mean at omega of minus 180 degrees at ok at the omega where the phase is 180 degrees where do you expect the point to lie on the imaginary axis somewhere here right so let's say that point is here ok let me let's say that point is here I'll bring it up here this is going to be omega equals 0 ok so we are going like this so we are plotting algebra we are plotting omega as positive and increasing ok what happens after that <laughs> it is going to move into the second quadrant now because phase goes even slow it goes lower than minus 180 so that moves into the second second quadrant and amplitude is still decreasing right ok that is not drawn well ok what happens at omega equals infinity <coughs> it is right at the origin magnitude is 0 what happens to the phase minus 270 so it is basically like a vector of 0 magnitude and tangential to the I mean a tangent which is parallel to the uh, j omega axis if so you do this ok omega equals infinity ok yes at any point this is going to be t of j omega this is going to be angle of t of j omega ok what happens when omega is negative 
will get the exact mirror image of this. Okay? So in other words, you'll get something like this. Uh, Okay, so it goes like this, <laughs> right? This is called your Nyquist plot. <coughs> In this case, I'm going to put a point minus one zero. Okay. In other words, when the real part is minus one, imaginary part is zero. Okay. Why are we doing this first of all? We have loop gain. We know, let's say, you, I, uh, many of you told me a few weeks, uh, a few classes ago that, you know, when magnitude becomes one phase becomes uh, 180 degrees, then it's unstable. Okay? What if magnitude is two and phase is 180? Is it stable or unstable? Right? You want to find that out. Okay? So, the Nyquist rule says that if your polar plot of the loop gain or if the Nyquist plot encircles minus one zero okay then the system is unstable okay so in other words if you draw the polar plot and the polar plot encircles minus one z comma zero then this is a sign of instability okay or you can call it minus one J zero, it doesn't matter. Okay. <coughs> In this particular case, how will you find out if it encircles minus one zero or not? I just do, I just put in minus one zero inside. But how do you find out if it encircles minus 1 0 or not? It depends on omega 180. It actually depends on F time, okay, A of omega 180, J omega 180 times F. Correct? If the magnitude of that is greater than 1, you know it's definitely going to encircle it. Correct? Okay. And <coughs> actually what the plot tells you is if it actually encircles minus 1 comma 0 it means your closed loop transfer function will have right half plane poles. Okay, so that is what the Nyquist criterion tells you. Okay, what else does it tell you? So it also is actually quite powerful because it also tells you the number of right half plane poles is equal to the number of encirclements. Okay, so the number of times the plot actually encircles minus 1 comma 0 is equal to the number of right half plane poles. In this case, how many times, how many poles do you think there are? There are two. So you have encircled this one and for negative you have encircled it again. So, this also tells you you are going to have two right half plane poles. Why is this so important? Why can't you just do with body plots? Actually, the nice thing about this 
is that you can actually plot this for any function. Okay, it doesn't have to be a rational function, right? When you do a body plot, you have normally dealt with rational functions. But we just saw cases where if there is a delay, for example, it's not a rational function, it has an exponential, right? You can easily plot t of j omega, even if you have an exponential, you can find out that so it is actually very powerful. You can take into account delays, you can take into account all kinds of things. Okay? Okay? <clears throat> what is the significance of this minus 1 comma 0? <laughs> Closed loop is 1 plus. So what that means is, if the Nyquist plot goes through minus 1 comma 0, what can you tell? What can you say about the system? It will actually have poles on the j omega axis. Okay? Let me call this Nyquist diagram. Okay? On the on the S plane. And if the Nyquist diagram encircles minus one comma zero, what can you tell about the poles? They're going to be in the right half plane. Right? So typically it may, it may do something like this. Okay? <laughs> so let us say you have a system where the plot is actually going through minus 1 comma 0. Okay? Now you are going to increase the feedback, let's say. I increase F. What is going to happen to the plot? it's basically going to expand linearly with f because all you are doing is plotting uh, magnitude of t of j omega and it will expand to include uh, minus 1 comma 0 right so in other words you can say that the poles of the system are going to move from the j omega axis to the right half plane okay And now everybody knows the concept of, so that's, as far as Nyquist plot, you can do it for any, any system, right? We know that, okay? So now let's say, go back to our old system, the Bode plot. Get something like this, okay? This is your... 20 log A naught and you have poles at P1, P2, P3 and this is your uh, phase plot. Let me uh, so it starts from 0 and maybe goes to minus 270. Okay? You can find the plot where, of course in this case I have shown it uh, quite badly, but uh, so let me do a better job of it. So let's pick a point here. Okay. So if you pick a point where this is minus 180 degrees, I am going to call this omega naught. <clears throat> okay. This is the point where the phase crosses 180 degrees. So let us say I draw a line like this and I call this X. Okay. Once you apply feedback, 
So let us say this one is going to be approximately 20 log 1 over f. Okay, I draw a point there. Okay. What is this x difference? So let us say I take this point 20 log 1 over f and I plot it. What is that x actually? The difference between the two curves? 20 log a naught minus 20 log 1 over f which is 20 log af. What is that? That's just the loop gain in db. So in other words, the loop gain in db is like you are you're basically moving the zero axis here and that is your new loop gain. Okay. Point where the loop gain crosses zero will be the 180 degree point where the phase becomes 180 degrees. Okay. I'm going to call that omega naught. <coughs> okay. And uh, sorry, that is, is it not 180 degrees. It's, it can be any point actually. Sorry. 180 degrees could be somewhere else, but this difference is the phase margin of the system, right? That you have learnt already, right? Find out the point where the thing crosses, find the phase at that point, how far away it is from 180 degrees is the phase margin, correct? Now what you can also tell is at 180 degrees you can get this point so this is your phase margin this is what is called gain margin at so this is your loop gain right loop gain is going to follow this at omega equals 180 degrees the magnitude in db minus the 0 db which is your unity gain is going to be your gain margin ok So what can you tell about uh, about the stability? What do you what do you need the gain phase ma margin to be? What do you need the gain margin to be? You need the phase margin to be positive, and you need the gain margin to be negative. Okay, right? Because you wanted to have cross, right? Only if it has crossed the one, it, only if you have, um, it has passed uh, the uh, gain equals uh, zero dB of the the loop gain equals zero dB point before it is 180 degrees only then the Nyquist plot will not encircle minus 1 comma 0 ok so that is your gain margin sometimes people also you know express the gain margin in positive terms I think that's also ok technically it is supposed to be negative the gain margin is negative in db you can say gain margin is minus 20 db or something but a lot of people will tell you gain margin is 20 db and you know what they mean So what is phase margin for a single pole system? Ninety degrees. Correct? What is gain margin for a one pole system? Phase never reaches one eighty degrees, so it's infinity, minus infinity. Okay? <coughs> so we look at one last thing we look at quickly is the so what is the significance of phase margin? So what we will do is, we will look at how the magnitude of T of j omega behaves when you vary the phase margin. Okay? So let us say, phase margin is 60 degrees. What is angle of T of j omega naught? 
Oh, sorry. Let's start off at 45. It's minus 135 degrees. We'll do 45, 60, and then we'll look at what happens in other cases also. Let's do 45. Okay. What is your, this is your closed loop. Okay. So what we want is A of J omega naught. Okay, is nothing but A of J omega naught over 1 plus minus J 135 degrees. First of all, you also know that equals 1 at the face margin point. Okay, what does this mean? A of J omega naught times F is 1, which means A of J omega naught is 1 over F. Correct? And now you can express this as a complex number. So this will be approximately 1 over f times 1 over So the magnitude, if you plot the magnitude at omega naught it is going to be 1.3 over f. What is it at low frequencies? What is mod of a, a of j omega at low, very low frequencies? It's just 1 over f. Right? In a feedback system, it's just 1 over f. Correct? Right? So if you actually plot Now we can plot the relative gain, normalized gain versus normalized frequency and what you will find is, let us say we, we normalize it to 1 over f, ok. So at omega naught for a 45 degree phase margin, 1.3 is approximately 2.4 dB. Okay, so at omega naught you get a 2.4 dB peaking. Okay, what is the single pole actually? Let's do that. What is the single pole going to look like? What is this? For a single pole system, at omega naught, how much, what is the relative gain going to be? Minus 3 dB, right? Correct? So this is phase margin of ok now you can do the same thing for a phase margin of 60 degrees so let us uh, do that so 60 degrees looks a little bit better something like this it turns out at phase margin equal to 60 degrees at omega naught there is no peaking but slightly before omega naught you have approximately 0.2 I think it is 0.2 or 0.3 dB peaking ok So this is 60 degrees, this is 45 degrees. What happens if we reduce the phase margin to 30 degrees, what do you think is going to look like? You get a lot more peaking. You get something like this. So slowly if you keep reducing a phase margin, what will happen is your gain, you know, you will get larger and larger peaking 
till if you have no face margin at all you will get infinite gain at that point and that's when you will have oscillations ok for a well behaved system you normally want your face margin to be around 60 degrees in that case you won't get a very right you will get a fairly flat magnitude response ok uh, let me say and this is relative frequency so this is relative frequency of 1 ok so for a well behaved system you want face margin of 60 degrees and if you really need to reduce it further maybe 45 degrees would typically be the lower limit of, of face margin which you would tolerate ok now obviously if you keep changing the face margin you also have implications on the transient response ok that you can figure out for yourself it's not uh, um, you know I think you have already done transient response for uh, different phase margins right ok ok so what we will do is we will stop here so from tomorrow we will start off with uh, so now we have pretty much done with most of the control systems portion uh, th from tomorrow we will start off with op amps right we will start off with how do you realize so we will started off with an integrator and this resistor feedback and so on so we will start off how do you realize an integrator using op amps then we will go on to different kinds right we will work at a slightly higher level then go down to the details.